recording. And then I'm gonna give myself the highlight here or a spotlight, I guess we call it. And that should allow you to see a little better what I'm doing. Yeah. So what prompted all this was uh, going out with uh, Jim McDonald to tour the Saanich Peninsula looking for places to access uh, the beach for fishing for cutthroat. And I looked at his fly fishing box and he had a bunch of small flies similar to these ones here. And that prompted me to think about time. And he had some cloud, small clousers. There's some uh, Mickey fins and a few others. So I decided I would build myself a cutthroat box. And that one of the things I wanted to do was tie some smaller clouser minnows. This is the typical clouser that I would tie for fishing for coho up around Prince Rupert. So that's like a size four hook uh, and it's fairly long, reasonably sparse. And, and the most popular one that I would do there is uh, chartreuse over white. Now, the one that I'm gonna tie today is what I would call a mini clouser. And that's this guy here. You can see there's a significant difference in size. <laughs> and uh, it, it's also a lot sparser tied. So that's what we're gonna tie. Uh, now, we did do clousers before once for the larger sized ones, but I will reiterate the things that I learned from Mr. Bob Clouser himself uh, when he was uh, at the Calgary fly fishing show. And there are a few little tricks that you need to, to know to tie these things right. So I've debarbed, this is a number eight O'Shaughnessy. It's a heavy hook, one uh, X long. It's, uh, it's, if it's not coated, it's not stainless. I think it's, it's plated. Um, it tends to be a little on the brittle side. So you have to be careful when you put it in the vise not to clamp it too hard. I've broken a couple in the vise. So I, I'm using white thread. Uh, it's 140, I think. I'm gonna start right behind the eye. And then I'm gonna wrap the thread all the way down the shank to just past the halfway point. And trim the tag off. And then I'm gonna bring the thread forward to just a little in front of the halfway point, not quite a third from the front. And at this point, I'm going to build a little bump of thread. And this is the key to getting the eyes to stay where you want them. And I've got this bump of thread. I'm gonna leave my thread hanging at the back of the little bump. Uh, now maybe I can just give you a little more magnification here. I just need to adjust the lighting to do this. I'm going to put the uh, magnifier down. That might help a little. So once I've got that, I'm going to take my dumbbell eyes, and these are like a one eighth inch. They're quite small, and I'm going to put them on the shank just behind the bump and pull them up to the bump, and then I'm going to wrap over top of the eye on the far side and then twist them a little bit and wrap diagonally over top on the near side. And while I'm doing this, I'm making sure they're pushed up snug against that bump. And then I'm just gonna do cross wraps one way and then the other way. And when I'm all done that, those eyes are on there really solid. They are not going to twist much. Now to make sure, I'm just going to put a teeny touch of glue there that will penetrate those threads. And it will just make sure that they're stuck on the shaft so they don't twist. And typically though, the bump, if it's, it's about the right size, it won't allow them to twist very much. Couple more wraps just to make sure it's there. Dave, then I gotta... are, those, are those the um, uh, bead chain eyes? 
No, they're they're a miniature miniature dumbbells. Miniature, yeah, they're called the uh, hourglass eyes. Okay. Ex extra small. Oh, okay. Thank you. Now I'm going to take my thread forward and I'm going to let it sit halfway between the eyes and the eye of the hook. And that's where I'm going to tie in the belly, which is bucktail, white bucktail. Now, the trick with this is for these little guys is don't make it too thick. So I'm going to take. It looks some, like a calf tail, Dave. Not that, a that is a calf tail, and the reason <laughs> I use the calf tail as opposed to bucktail for these small guys is that uh, the bucktail hair is a little coarse to build a small eye, but the rest of it will be will be bucktail. Uh, and and for the for some of them, I did use a bucktail. And um, let me just dig this out for a sec. Some of these these dyed bucktails. Like this guy. Would fox work on these little ones? They, yeah, they, they they come they when they dye them, you get brown in the middle and white on the outside. And so I've got some of those. Uh, and I've used this stuff. But the the length of them isn't quite as even as the calf tail. But buck tail works just as well. I've got some tied that way. And I'm gonna not gonna take too much. And and it, it I want short. I don't want the fly to extend more than about a full shank length behind the hook. So I'm going to take, I'd say, half of a gap width of hair. I'm going to cut it off at the bottom here. Then I'm going to take my hair stacker. This is my large sized hair stacker. I'm going to put the bucktail in there and then I'm going to make a bunch of noise here because I'm going to hold it by the base so that the top rattles a little bit and I'm going to and then when I pull the hair out the ends are going to be relatively even you can see they're fairly close to being even and I'm going to measure it for the length that I want. So I want it to come back to about there and put hold it with my right hand right at the eye of the hook. So that's about the length I want. I'm gonna take my left hand and I'm gonna pinch the hair right where the eyes are with my left hand. And I'm gonna take my scissors and I'm gonna trim off the butts a little less than a quarter inch long away from my fingers, trim them off square. And I got this little bit sticking out. There we go. Now the trick is, I uh, didn't get all of them. Now I'm gonna hold this down at about a 35 to 45 degree angle, right on top of my thread with the front edge of the buck the tail hair right behind the eye. And I'm going to make a loose wrap over top and cinch it down gently. And if it overlaps the eye, I'll pull it back a little bit, but that measured pretty good. It's right even with the eye. Then I'm gonna wrap some good tight wraps in front and then right back to where the eye is. Bring my thread under the eyes and in behind and pull down gently and then I'm gonna start wrapping back to the bend of the hook. I'm gonna hold the hair up while I do this so that that hair sits on top of the hook shank as I wrap it back right to the bend. When I get to the bend, I want this hair to flare a bit. So I'm gonna hold it up with my right hand and I'm gonna put the thread in behind and pull forward a little bit in the, between the shank and the hair to cause that hair to stand up a bit. So you see it's now not bending down, it's standing up a little. Bring my thread back underneath the eyes and back in front and let it hang again at that halfway point. And at this point, I'm gonna use my rotary vise to turn the whole thing upside down. 
I like to do this with a little flash. So I have a little bit of crinkle mirror flash or crystal flash. And I'm gonna pull a couple of uh, strands out of the bag here. And I'm gonna double them in half. If I can find the bits. These fine things are sometimes hard to work with. They tend to go everywhere. I'm gonna double them in half, they're fairly long. And then I'm gonna lay it down on top of the hook shank so that the, the little loop at the back is pretty much even with the tails. And I hold that straight on the hook shank and I'm going to make a couple of wraps over top, <clears throat> pinch it down. And that's on the near side of the hook, kind of laying in that little crock between the eye and the, and the body underneath. I'm gonna take the front ends and I'm gonna pull them back and lay them in that same little, little V that occurs right between the eye and the body of the fly. I'm gonna tie those down. What that does is that keeps them on top of the eyes and it keeps them relatively central to the, to the hook shank. Missed that, missed that one. There we go. And then I'm gonna bring my scissors in and I'm gonna trim them just a hair longer than the white bucktail. So that's pretty good. And once again here, I'm going to leave that hook upside down. I'm gonna take my chartreuse bucktail and the same thing I'm gonna take, oh, not too much, that's maybe a little much, but I know I'm gonna lose some when I finish grooming this. So again, about, that'll be maybe half a hook shank to start with, hook gap to start with, but I will lose some in this grooming process. So I've cut them off, I'm gonna hold them by the butts here and you see I've got some really long ones. So I'm going to hold them by the butts with my left hand. I'm going to take these really long fibers and gently pull them out of the bunch and try and line the tips up with the tips of the remaining ones. So they're all roughly the same tip size. Now tip length. Now these, these hairs are too long for this fly. So before I stack them, I'm going to trim them down a bit. I'm going to trip them down longer than what I need on the fly, but that's just so they fit in the stacker properly. So I've trimmed them down a bit. Then when I stick them in the hair stacker, there we go. You can see that they just protrude a little bit past the end. And now when I pull them out, you'll see that all the tips are Nicely lined up. Pull them up by the tip. And then I'm going to measure them again. And I want these guys to be just a hair longer than the weight. So I'm going to hold them again at the eye of the hook so that they're the right length. Take my left hand right where the eye is. And I'm going to do the same thing as I did with the weight. I'm going to pinch them and then I'm going to cut about a quarter inch in front of my fingers. So there's that quarter inch. And again, at a 45 degree angle, I'm gonna take them down just where the eye is. And I'm gonna make a loose wrap. Now this is, this, this, what, this, my vice is a little loose. So I'm gonna make this loose wrap. And you see now that there's a few that are extending past the eye. So I'm just gonna Gently pull them back so they clear the eye. And wrap them down. And then turn them back over. Get any loose hairs out of there. There are a few mallards at the front. You don't want to lay down nice and tidy. Then I'm gonna make this little torpedo shaped head that has a, a bit of a 
skinny snout and a little fatter as it gets back to the eyes with thread. When I get the shape covered, right? When I get the it's sort of the right shape and reasonably smooth, I'm then going to uh, bring my third right to behind the eye and I'll do a double whip finish. Second one, pull it snug, cut the thread. I'm gonna take my Sally Hansen hard as nails. And I'm gonna give it a very light coat just on the nose. Now, one of the things that happens when you're doing this, you end up with the odd little hair that sticks over the eye. I'm just gonna trim those out. There you go. Make sure that the Sally Hansen doesn't clog up the eye. I take my bodkin and clean out the eye. And then I'm gonna just take it out of the vise and you'll see that all the hair, because of the way it's tied, all the hair is on one side of the hook. So I'm just gonna lift them up and set them down so that there's a little bit of the green hair on either side of the hook. Now, if you want, these are just pure silver eyes. If you want a little darker, I just take a, a Sharpie, which is not water soluble. It'll come off with uh, isopropyl alcohol. But I'm just going to mark the ends of these with a, with a Sharpie to make them black. That's him. Very nice. So, day. so it, it's a nice sparse little fly. It's at the most maybe two inches long. I think that'll be a, a good you could call it a panfish fly, or you could call it a, a skinny water trout fly. I'm thinking it might work pretty well on uh, sea rat cutthroat. I've done a couple of different colors. This one uses uh, white uh, and uh, bucktail and, and green bucktail, dyed green bucktail. This one is actually uses polar bear. I've got uh, some white polar bear and some gold colored polar bear. <clears throat> and the last one is uh, one that uses white bucktail and orange polar bear. So you can play, I think you can play with colors and it probably be a good idea to carry a, a bunch of different colors depending on what the lighting conditions are and what the fish might like. So that's him. Oh, you can see again. Ooh, that's way bright. That's bright. Okay. Um, you can see the difference between that and what the, the standard clouser is in size. The standard clouser is probably double the size and, and double thick. So they're a little finicky, more finicky to tie, but I think they uh, I think they're gonna work pretty well. So Dave, that's what um, what weight are uh, the, the dumbbell eyes? They're quite light. Okay. Um, so they don't add much weight at all? Uh... Yeah, well, about all they do with the weight is they make sure that when, and oh, that's the other key. When you tie this onto your tippet, you're gonna use a non-slip loop. Yeah. And then what happens is that the, what the eyes will do is they'll roll it over. So the white's on the bottom. And the and the green is on the top. Yeah. So you always you always start with the white because that's going to be the belly of the fly, and then whatever contrasting color you use is going to be on the top. And because you tied it this way, you'll see that the the flash goes over top of the eye when it's in this position. So the flash is always going to stay. It's not going to hang down here. 
Mm -hmm. And that's how they fish. And the, and the non-slip loop is what makes sure that they roll over. Otherwise, sometimes the knot will keep it the other way around. So there you go. That is my small size clousers. And I've tied, I've tied a few big ones <laughs> as well. So, but I'm, I, I, the bigger ones I'm gonna take with me when I go to Hanina. So I will add these to my cutthroat box and we're done. Very nice, thank you. Now flooring is up. Dave? Yeah. I'm gonna spotlight you here. No need. Oh, you, you're right, I don't have to spotlight you. There you go. Oh, because I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be- Yeah, hogging. you're using a camera, so. I'm hogging the screens with my document camera. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. So. Okay. Yeah. So um, I posted last night. You might have you might have seen it. Um, three variants of the well-known elk hair caddis, and one of these is absolutely the easiest one to tie, in my opinion, and that's the no hackle uh, peacock curl body one. <laughs> which is um, unlike the comparadons, I don't think this is really um, a smooth, I mean, of course you can fish everything on smooth water. Um, just make sure your, you know, um, whip finishes are nice and tidy when you do that. Um, but this floats well, um, just like a regular caddis. And for, for years, um, I just avoided all the extra headache of trying to tie a, a hackle on the on the elk hair caddises plus putting a hackle on there is always uh, a bit of a fragile affair you have to put a copper rib on top of it to, to hold that that hackle together so this one has a lot of advantages so i um you know i fished this for for a very long time before i even thought about doing the what's normally known as the standard elk hair caddis so here it goes doesn't need an awful lot of explanation. Um, this is a size 12 hook and the thread is a dot. So just go in and do a little thread base here. And then attach one or two strands of, of peacock. Now this is some peacock hurl from eye feathers directly. And some of it is fluffier than others. So I'm going to take two of these relatively skinny ones. It's, it's enough even for, for a size 12, given that you're going to discard the tips anyway as being way too fragile. And the way to get around the fragility of the peacock is going to be to put the whole thing in a dubbing loop. I find that to be a um, far better way to secure peacock than to use um, than to use ribs. Now the key tool to have for this kind of thing, of course, is a pair of hackle pliers, which I knew that there was something I forgot to bring. Uh, here it goes. Rotating hackle pliers is my tool of choice in this case. So all I'm doing is, and maybe I should move the camera a little bit so you can actually see what I'm doing. Maybe zooming out is all is needed and a bit down. So I'm grabbing the thread and the two strands of peacock together, grabbing the whole thing with the hackle plier, 
and then double the thread back to the hook like this. So this creates my dubbing loop and then move the thread to the front, okay? So now all I have to do is I just have to start twisting, make sure that I don't catch the point of the hook. So just start twisting here. As you can see, I get a nice dubbing rope going. And I don't twist the whole thing to the end because I, I run the risk of actually breaking that peacock rope. So the peacock breaks, not the thread. So then just keep twisting a little bit more as you keep wrapping. And naturally you're going to get a little bit of a taper going here because the hurl gets thicker as you get nearer the butts. So you keep wrapping and when you've had enough, you just secure this, two or three turns of thread. If you wanna be super secure, you just pull the peacock curl back and double back over it. Although this is pretty strong stuff because you've got that, that little bit of uh, thread in the middle there, it makes a big difference, okay? So now you can go back to where we were and reposition the camera a little bit and refocus. Okay. So this should go away. All right. Now the only thing that's left is to add the wing, which is in this case, I'm just going to use some um, elk hair. This is kind of long, even for a size 12. But what I'm doing is I feel bad about wasting all that super premium butt end part of the hair. So I collect this in a little container. And so when I get the urge, when this container is full enough, I'm going to get the urge to do some spun hair uh, bodies like a Goddard caddis or something. And then I have a nice um, collection here of perfect hair for spinning, right? Because when you spin hair, you waste the tips. When you do wings on flies, you waste the butts. So this way I don't waste either the butts or the tips. So I just have to, to tie both uh, hair wing flies. And, um, and hair bodied ones with, with spun, spun bodies. Okay, so get a little clump of, of hair here, cut it nice all the way down and then just clean up. This is fairly clean hair. It uh, doesn't need an awful lot and can always be cleaned again after you've stacked it. So put in the hair stacker and give it a few noisy taps. Here's the wing. So measure the wing. I like the wing to go basically to the to the bend of the hook. This is a standard um, mast at 94A40. So transfer to the other hand. Keep everything hidden between my fingers, so I can do a couple of soft loops prior to tightening down. And going here, I have to be a little careful because this is eight odd and I don't want to break it. Okay. So here's my wing in place. And then I leave deliberately, I leave this butt ends long. So it's really easy to lift up, put a few good wraps in front there and then do a whip finish. And again, with long butt ends, it's easy to maneuver here. Pull them back with the same hand you're holding the bobbin with and, uh, 
and do two whip finishes. Again, I don't bother with any head cement on these flies. They're nice and sturdy enough like this. And then cut. And that's almost that. The last thing to do is get everything here nicely into position. Grab these butt ends and take a good look at the fly. You can only do this cut once. And there you go. And this beautiful clump of hair that's left over is going to make me some nice bodies at some point. And it goes into the container. There is a floating dragonfly nymph that requires a body of mixed olives and tans and whatever colors of hair you've got. So that might be a good idea for that as well. So this is the one um, pattern. Of course, it's a lot easier to tie when you're not talking. The second one, if we've got some time, oh, we do have time today. The second one I'm going to do is the so-called excadis, which is kind of a well-known well known thing that you're gonna find in, in fly tying books. And this guy basically is take the hackle off the standard elk hair caddis and put in a little tail of synthetic material there like a trailing shuck, okay? And some books list uh, an amber color for this. Um, you can use brown, whatever you would normally use for, for a trailing shuck. Um, I think it's good. And I thought I'd liven this up a little bit by using orange thread because all those wet flies, you know, like partridge and orange um, are excellent um, caddis fly um, patterns to fish. So I thought adding, a, adding an orange here might not, be a, might not be a bad idea. So the body is, is just hair is ear dubbing. Okay, so we'll do this one. So now I'm going to switch to the orange thread. I'm keeping everything on size 12 hooks for, for now. Do a thread base on the hook and go all the way to the bend of the hook so I have room to attach <clears throat> the Zilon. But this is a synthetic material that's kind of very, very shiny and it's fairly soft texture. It's pretty, I, li I like to, to tie with it. It's also very easy to work with. And for a size it's, it's tool, actually, you don't. It's Sorry? actually carpet fiber. It's what they call trilobal. That's what makes it shiny. Yeah, it may be some expensive carpet because any any carpet that I've ever seen is like some really vile fiber. It's nothing this nice. So I don't know what kind of high end carpet uh, this stuff goes into, but nothing that I've normally encountered. And this comes in a in a sort of like a shuck. Uh, it a... it comes in a like a little a little hank like this. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I think it also might come on spools. Yeah. Um, most of what I have comes in in hanks like this. Okay. Together by a zip tie. Yeah. In 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 cross section, the fibers are actually like a little triangle. It's three different lobes that are in a triangle, which is what gives it its shiny appearance. Yeah, which probably also makes it an excellent material for you know those uh, sparkle pupae. Uh, yes. Things that are you know the those Lafontaine patterns. Very Lafontaine ones, yeah. Yeah. 
So anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure shank length. I'm going to cut. Ah. Yeah, we talked about sharpening scissors last week, and I uh, I didn't get around to it. I started to think about it, but I haven't gotten my aluminum foil to do a bit of sharpening of the uh, of the scissors. Okay, so measure the length, transfer to the tying point, and tie over it. I'm going to dub the body so I don't really need all this extra bulk here. Yeah, that, that stuff is used sometimes as a trailing shock on mayfly imitations as well. Yeah, I, I would uh, I would use it um, if I want to, to switch from the brown macrame yarn that I use on CFFs. I would use a little bit of Zilon as a, as a CFF uh, tailing yeah. material. So yeah. And any um, any other fly where you uh, you don't want to bother with traditional methods of you know using either uh, you know hair or or splitting splitting fibers or or who knows what um, I guess the RS squad is another place where you you'd be using this yeah. stuff for for a trailing shack as well. Just dab some um, some hairs here. So this is all standard stuff that we've seen before. A little bit at a time, so you don't end up with huge unmanageable clumps of dubbing. That's yeah. always you can always. It's like a bit like salt. You can always add more salt, but it's pretty hard to take it out. Right, so <laughs> that's a good. That's analogy. why I tend to cook rather under salted because you know if you feel like it could use a little bit more salt, I won't be offended. Okay. Now at this point, one thing I might consider doing because it's easier to do now than to do later is just do a little. Oops. Just do a little. Uh, not for safety, because you never know what might happen. And then take a little brush. And this came with one of those hair cutter beard trimmer. It's a fairly soft, a fairly stiff plastic brush. And try to scruff this up a little bit, because you want you want this dubbing to be you know, a little messy looking even before the fish have a chance to to go at it, okay? Now, if there are some ridiculously long fibers, probably they don't matter, but it, it, it really bugs me when I see them. And it's uh, not that I got into the habit of, of taking pictures of the flies so I can post prior to the tying session, uh, I really get very annoyed at all these little things sticking out that I didn't notice when I tied the fly and I only see when I put a macro lens to it. Okay, so there we go. Okay, now repeat same procedure as before. Take a little clump of hair, put on the wing and that's the X caddis. Again, no hackle, relatively easy thing to tie. Clean the hair stack. And then. Put the wing on. There's the hair. Again, measure, transfer to soft loops, and then start tightening properly. And always 
do the tightening on your side. That'll help keeping the wing from rolling over. A few wraps in front. As you can see, there's still fuzz here at the at the end that I haven't fully taken out before stacking, but that doesn't matter because it doesn't go on the fly. Okay. So then this is going to be whip finished. And then two whip finishes is enough. One, two. All right, same thing as before. Just grab the wing fibers here. Make sure that everything is where you want it to be. Measure and cut. That's the X caddis. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a standard pattern that you see given as a variant uh, in, in fly tying books. And the third one I was going to do, time permitting, and time seems to be permitting, is one where the, the body, so let me show you just the body. So the body of the fly is saltwater flashaboo. with hackle and the copper rib to reinforce the hackle on top. So the challenge here is of course, hackle is a fragile business. That's one problem. The second problem with this fly is that tying anything on top of the flashaboo is a challenge because that's a slippery base for anything to, to, stay, to stay put. So I'm, I'm experimenting with putting a little bit of of head cement, well, Sally Hansen's, um, on top of the flashable prior to going with the hackle and and the rib. So this is the most elaborate of the of the three patterns, and it's it's closer in in difficulty and fussiness to the original one. Okay, I'm going to stay with the with the orange thread for now, and. I did some with brown and I kind of like the I kind of like the orange head on this thing so I'm going to give it a try to see how well it works as a as a hot spot. If hot spots work on nymphs, I don't see why they should spook fish when you transfer them to to dry flies. Okay, so thread base, and now you just kind of have to think reverse order of everything, right? So the first thing that goes on is going to be the copper rib. Ugh. Okay. What's gonna happen, I guess? I managed two patterns without breaking the thread and it always happens during fly tying demonstrations. It never happens when I tie flies, right? And you believe that. <laughs> of course I never break the thread. Why would I? Well, I think there was a gremlin uh, <clears throat> that obviously affected your thread last night uh, before this tying session. So that it would break just for this event. Yeah, after I finished tying the um, the flies for for taking pictures of the gremlins went in there and I see what a mess. Yeah, I fear not. This happened at the early stages of tying this fly, so no biggie whatsoever. So reattach the thread, and then all that needs to be done is just a wee bit of tidying up. There you go. See. You can't even tell that anything had ever happened here. Take that, gremlins. Okay. So attach the wire alongside the hook shank. 
and then let it hang there. And what I like to do here is use a slightly undersized saddle hackle. It hardly really matters. This is a furnace one because I just happen to have a saddle in this color. And as you can see, the, uh, the hackle size is not one and a half uh, gap of the hook. It's more like one, maybe 0.9 times the gap of the hook. So it's, it's just a little undersized. I guess alternatively, you could use a bigger hackle and just take your scissors and do a bit of a haircut on the bottom. I don't know how much it, it really matters fussing with the, with the size of the hackle on these things. Okay, then attach this at the end. And what I normally do is I just trim a little bit of the hackle at the tying point. So I have something that's not just a smooth quill to tie on, but something a little, uh, a little rougher that's gonna give me a, a better grip. Okay. And then I take some standard issue. This is the one eighth of an inch uh, flashaboo. You can get this this pearl um, tinsel material in, in mylar on spools as well. I think Uni, maybe Danville as well. I'm not sure, but I think Uni certainly makes this stuff. So when you go to smaller flies, you might want to go to a something smaller than. Than, than this size, um, but that's just a question of making the wrapping a little bit easier. You can double wrap this or you can single wrap it. Um, it's really, a, I've, done, I've done both. And I think single wrapping works well enough. So I, I'm not going to bother with, with double wrapping. Just keep the, the wraps kind of neat and tidy and then it should work well. Okay, so bring the thread to the front and then go at it slowly. If, if you feel that not enough light gets reflected back, just overlap a little bit more and that'll give you more reflection. Because this thing, once you wrap a couple of layers it becomes quite opaque. Okay, so when you reach the head of the fly, and as you can see, it's just, it's a little bit recalcitrant. This is almost borderline size-wise. And then bend it back and give it another a few good threads here. Hopefully this is gonna grip on it. And then just trim as close as you want. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a little bit of, so you can see this, um, I got this reflective base that's going to form the, the base of the body. Now I said, this is gonna be fussy and I'm only gonna do it if there is time. So I am going to give this a little bit of a coat those of you who are more courageous could be using, uh, I guess you could use super glue at this stage. Anyway, once you wrap the hackle on, there is no going back. So you just have to put on whatever you want to put on and then just go for it. Okay. If you forgot something, well, tough. You're going to have to start a new hook. So now wrap this in even spirals going forward. You don't wanna go in too close turns because you want that shiny stuff to show through. So that's a little bit of a, of a challenge here. You don't wanna lose the effect. Otherwise you've done all this work for, for nothing. Okay, so secure this properly at the end about three turns of thread and then trim the stem. 
And if your dull scissors don't work, take a better pair. Okay, now I'm going to rib over with a copper. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to counter wrap here. So I'm going to start at the back and go at a 45 angle degree angle going forward, which is going to go crisscross the hackle wraps. And some fibers will get matted down, but not too bad. Just don't worry about it. Wiggle the wire a bit if that really is too much. And then secure the wire at the head of the fly as well. Okay. And helicopter the wire away. And we're almost getting there. Okay. This is a little annoying here. You know, you get a few trapped fibers and you can always give it a little bit of a haircut at this point. If you want to be super tidy, here's a little trick. If you get a suitable kind of material, and these are some uh, bobbin stoppers that I got from Norvice, which are used, there are these little cones of silicone that you put over the bobbin so that your thread doesn't wrap all the way back. Uh, I think they also come as stoppers on some of the resin, uh, UV resin bottles. So anyway, you cut a little piece of that. So this is a, an original uh, Norm Norlander trick. Take one of these things and keep it on the bobbin. And then pull it back over the body so your hackle gets pushed nicely back. You don't have to poke your fingers to do anything at this point. And just do one little tidying up whip finish. What did I do? Okay. Now, don't get too excited and cut the thread at this point because the fly is not quite ready yet. So pull the thing back. And now it's time for the wing, okay? So I could stop at this point because this is, you know, same old, same old um, elk hair caddis. I'll take a clump of hair, cut it off the hide, clean it up a little bit. Although, as I said, your, your tips will always be clean. This hair is long enough that there's never any fuzz in the tips. Up. Measure. There we go. Transfer. I already broke the thread once, so I should be able not to break it anymore on this fly. Okay, secure the wing, lift the butt ends. I see a recalcitrant little hackle fiber here. There she goes. Okay. And the final two whip finishes. Right behind the eye of the hook. And try to find a clear path to your thread. And trim. And I'll just do the head of the fly. Final step. And 
Bingo. That's the, I don't know what to call it. It was a, it was a local guy here that, that told me to, to give this a try. And it's a, it's a nice, it's a nice, uh, it's a nice version. So this was Vince's uh, suggestion for you, Dave. Remember Vince, Chambry. Yeah, that's it. Good. And basically Good. it's the same thing you do on the standard l caddies instead of doing this extra complication with, uh, with the flash up, you just double body. And with the dub body, you don't have the problem of grippiness. You can, you can deal with it a lot easier. And alternatively, I'm thinking I haven't tried that yet. What you probably can try is do a dub body, put a hackle on, but then for the rib, instead of going with, um, instead of going with copper wire, I think if you use some uh, pearl crystal flash you get the same kind of greenish flash effect without the extra bother. So I think that that might be actually the easier way to do this particular uh, this particular pattern. And that's it for the caddis flies.